This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're checking in with the State Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair, Pete Harcum, a Westchester County Democrat who is with us in the studio to talk about the environmental portion of the state budget, which is due in less than a month. Thanks for visiting us, Senator. Always great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start on the fiscal side of the budget, and specifically the moves by Governor Hochul to cut annual appropriations for clean water by about $250 million and dip into the Environmental Protection Fund, uh, taking about $25 million for staff purposes. The conventional wisdom at the Capitol is that the state legislature will buy back that uh, money so that the status quo in those areas is preserved. But as someone who's actually in the rooms where the legislature's priorities are being discussed, how do you see these funding disagreements playing out? Well, they shouldn't have been cut in the first place. You know, this is not the area for the political footballs of Albany. We have enormous environmental challenges providing clean water to our municipalities. The new PFAS regulations are driving up costs exponentially. So now is not the time to be cutting funds in half for clean water funding. That's job number one. You know, it was during the the budget hearing, the commissioner was talking about, well, we have plenty of Bond Act money. The Bond Act, let's be very clear, was to supplement maintenance of effort funding, not supplant. So we need to be very clear about that. So we need the full 500 million and the advocates are calling for 600 million and they're correct. The need is incredibly great. The other one is something governors have tried over the years is to raid the Environmental Protection Fund for staff costs for DEC and parks. That's not a staff operational slush fund. That's for protecting the environment. That's an incredibly important fund. $25 million can go a really long way. So we're pushing back very hard on that. The Hochul administration has defended both proposals arguing on the EPF side that the $25 million for staff purposes essentially helps them spend the rest of the pool of the money. And on the clean water side of things, they argue that there's, one, a capacity issue, and two, if they try to spend all the money at once, they're going to be competing against themselves and driving up costs. Do you view those as good faith arguments, or do you feel like they are just part of a political gamesmanship and they are looking to have you buy these programs back. Well, the, the the first argument about needing staff in the Environmental Protection Fund to spend the Environmental Protection Fund, those staff lines need to be in the agency. You know, we don't have staff lines in clean water funding. We don't have staff lines in other grant funding. So why would we put it into the Environmental Protection Fund? So I, I push back strongly on that. And the other is, I think, rubbish, you know, that we somehow can't get money out the door. If they can't get money out the door, that's a problem with the agencies. You know, there are billions of dollars of projects uh, that need to be addressed, and, and municipalities can't get the money fast enough. Money is bottled up in the, in the Environmental Facilities Corporation, and, and this notion of driving up prices, if anything, it, it drives prices down because the competition is greater. More jobs, um, more economies of scale. We have union members sitting around clamoring for work who want to work. These are good paying projects. But more importantly, the longer we wait, the higher the costs increase. So I believe this is your sixth budget as a state senator. So how do you foresee this issue playing out? Do you think that this money ends up fully funded in the final budget? I hope so. Where it comes from, I I don't really care. This thing about governor's cutting, legislature putting back, you know, we're we're just having this conversation about 211. 211 is a vital statewide service. And every year, whether it's this governor, the past governor, it gets cut out. And then the legislature is, is, as you say, quote unquote, buying it back. These are vital services for the people in New York. They should be in the budget and they shouldn't be political footballs. Well, turning to potentially low-hanging fruit on the policy side of things, the governor has embraced part of the New York Heat Act in her budget, specifically advancing an end to the so-called 100-foot rule that allows gas services to be extended to new customers and the costs are basically subsidized by existing ratepayers. The Senate has passed the full, more expansive version of this proposal in the past, whereas the Assembly has not moved it in any capacity. Is the Senate still looking for a full loaf or do you envision being content with the governor's language from the state budget? Well, I I don't want to 
necessarily get ahead of my Senate colleagues as to what might be in our one house. Mm-hmm. I think Senator Kruger's bill is a more comprehensive bill. You know, we will try and pass out legislatively regardless of, of what goes on in the next few weeks. I thank the governor for putting that in her budget. We don't think it goes as far as Senator Kruger's bill. So I, I think hers is a good bill, but I think there'll be a negotiation between the two. But we're off to a good start with what she staked down in the ground in the budget, and, and we'll move forward from there. And in terms of a negotiation, if we have the Senate pushing a more expansive version and the Assembly pushing nothing, it seems like the middle ground would be the governor's plan then. We don't know. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I, I don't want to sit here with the Ouija board and say where we'll be. Where you don't want to negotiate be. against yourself on the air right now? No, no, I, I tend not to do that. Well, before we move on, let me reintroduce you for listeners just joining us. We're speaking with State Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Pete Harcum, a Westchester County Democrat. And one of the big issues that you've been focusing on since becoming Environmental Conservation Committee Chair is this idea of creating an extended producer responsibility program addressing packaging waste. And you and your assembly counterpart, Deb Glick, a Manhattan Democrat, seem to be marching to the same beat on this issue. You've held joint hearings together. Where do things stand on that as a standalone bill compared to getting it inserted into the budget conversation? Well, it's not in the budget conversation. There was some talk of of that last year Mm -hmm. that didn't materialize. So we're not going down that road again this year. But Chair Glick and I are working in collaboration. You may remember this bill's been around for years, but there were two bills. The Senate and the Assembly had very different bills. We made a commitment to work together on one bill and advance one bill forward if, if we're serious about getting something done. And, and that's what we've done. We've made a number of revisions to the original bill. We've listened to scores of stakeholders, and we have made it easier to implement for companies that, that may be regulated under this. For instance, if the technology does not allow for the recycled content that's called for in the law, they can apply for a waiver. If the rates and dates are too aggressive, the producer responsibility can appeal to the commissioner of DEC to move the rates and dates. We heard from agriculture that the million dollar threshold was not high enough. So we raised that to 5 million in revenue. And then the other thing that we most recently did as we understand there are going to be costs associated with companies implementing this, we now made those companies eligible for New York state tax programs like the Excelsior tax program or the manufacturer's investment tax credit in New York, because some of these investments may be sizable and we want to be able to assist them and incentivize them on this path. So as you and I have discussed this issue over months and maybe even years at this point, you've highlighted your personal effort to incorporate the input and advice from people who weren't necessarily on board with this proposal. Is there a line, though, where you feel like you have to say, okay, enough is enough. We can't raise thresholds anymore. We can't carve out more elements of this in order to have a a comprehensive and meaningful bill? And if so, do you feel like you're approaching that line? What we have said and what I've said to all of the groups who come to us, the first thing they want is an exception or an exemption for their industry. And we say we're not doing exemptions because if you're trying to change the system, everybody in the system needs to be part of the change. So we have put some off ramps for people who may have trouble with some aspects of the law and they're temporary. They're not they're not exemptions. So we will continue to listen to stakeholders. We have made three revisions now and then we will see if both houses pass this and obviously the governor may want to weigh in in the chapter amendment process and that could be another round of revisions. But you know, we don't want to negotiate against ourselves. So we we have made a lot of revisions, I think, that are very positive to make this a more fair bill. But we continue to listen and and speak with, with concerned stakeholders. In terms of negotiations, though, is the conversation on this issue solely between the Senate and Assembly at this point? And the plan is the governor can weigh in after it's been passed in the form of pushing for chapter amendments, or or will this legislation only move forward if there is a so-called three-way agreement? 
again, we don't want to negotiate against ourselves. We, as a co-equal branch of government, have a right to determine what we think is the best path forward. And then the executive can weigh in, as, as is the, the governor's right to. We're just following the process. You know, I, I don't think anyone's being excluded here. We've spoken to the governor's office. We've spoken to DEC. We understand they have a different view on some things, and that's fine. That's democracy, and, and you know, we're willing to have those conversations, but when the time is right. Thinking about big picture waste issues, we recently did a segment about the state's solid waste management plan that came out at the end of 2023. And in that plan, there's a recommendation for basically putting some sort of fee on waste to basically deter people from producing waste. This could be individuals. And I'm curious whether that is something that's come up at all in the context of this year's budget or whether you think that is something that if it is ever be part of a conversation in Albany is going to be in 2025 and beyond. Well, we we want to reduce the cost and that and that's the point of this bill that you and I are just discussing now is that our taxpayers are drowning in the cost of waste whether it be in taxes or for people who pay directly for carters and the amount of waste that our municipalities have to manage now is out of control we don't have the land fill space for it. We don't want to open new incinerators. That may sound like an elegant solution unless you're a host community. So the impetus is to drive the cost down. And it's estimated that this this bill, once implemented, will save taxpayers between 250 and $450 million annually, money that can either go back into their pockets or for teachers, nurses, cops, uh, social workers. So Waste is taking up a bigger and bigger portion of municipal budgets, and and the aim is to reduce the cost. So you don't like, then, any sort of proposal that might put a fee on trash that doesn't get recycled well, well, or composted? Well, part, part of, part of what, what they're also talking about is, is on the commercial side. Forty mm-hmm. percent of landfill waste is commercial waste, things like buildings that have been demolished. That just goes to landfill spent an interesting couple of days in Ithaca. There are folks up there with Cornell doing pilots on deconstruction versus demolition. It takes no longer to deconstruct a building than to demolish a building. And then those those parts, those beams, those windows, those doors, all these things that have been sent to landfills traditionally can be repurposed and reused. And I think, you know, as we think about waste, both on the individual side, the commercial side, we have to start thinking in terms of a circular economy. And that's that's an exciting project that's going on up there. But just to be clear, though, do you think that there is some merit to the idea that putting a cost on per ton of garbage, say even $5 per ton, might make sense in ensuring that people are trying to be thoughtful in their waste plans moving forward, especially on the commercial side? On the commercial side, I, I would look at that. On the, on the personal side... We're trying to put the cost on the producers of that waste. They've got to think about the end use and how, how we get rid of that waste and be more responsible with that, and that will drive down the cost. So we don't want to put the cost on the consumer. We want to put the cost on the folks who are creating the waste and the packaging in the first place. Well, we've been speaking with State Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Pete Harkham. Senator, thank you so much for visiting us. Always a pleasure. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by National Fuel and its shareholders, a utility providing natural gas service to heat homes and businesses across western New York. Information on National Fuel's response to proposals to transition away from natural gas service is available at betterplannobans.com.